Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. I'd like to welcome you to The Gary Knoll Show. Well, how often have you said, gee, I wished I could change? And I'm saying, watch today's program and you're on your way. Change your life. Coming at you right now. It was the early 1970s and a Professor Bruce Lipton was doing some unusual work. He had taken the DNA, or the gene, out of cells. Now what he found that was remarkable and that would virtually revolutionize science was that the cell continued to do what it was supposed to do, but there was no gene there telling it what to do. That'd be like you having your brain removed and carrying on a conversation or going about your work. It wasn't possible. And he replicated it again, and it still came up that way. Recently, I had a conversation with uh, Professor Lipman, and I asked him, I said, what do you think caused this? And he said, at the moment that this happened, I didn't know. And my colleagues simply couldn't accept this out at Stanford University. So he had to go into another discipline. He had to go into quantum physics, and from there into Buddhism and existential beliefs before he would come up with an answer of how can the cell understand what to do if the basic programming is gone. Well, what he found was, and what has taken a long time for people to accept, and many still don't accept, is that it is the medium in which that cell existed that caused it to respond. I'm Gary Nall. In our program, we're going to explore what about the medium in which you exist, your beliefs, your attitudes, your actions, your emotions. You wake up one day and you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, 60, 70, or getting there or there slightly over and you're wondering, what am I doing? Because it's generally only at, at these decades that we begin to re-examine our life. It's almost like New Year's, New Year's, we're going to start all over, have new resolutions. Well, then about May, we think, haven't done anything, started and stopped. And then it's the same old, same old. I believe that we can understand a lot about human nature by combining science and beliefs, put them all together and see what do we have. And I'm going to take a little different approach than what you might expect. I'm going to ask you to start this whole process by looking at what would happen if you emptied your life. And that's our theme, emptying your life. What does it mean to empty your life? in order to better understand what your life could be, who you are, and think of all the mistakes you've made, think of all the things that if you've just been stymied by, and what can you put in its place? Well, what we try to do in our society is instead of emptying anything, we add something in. We're almost afraid to accept that, that maybe if we stopped long enough, got quiet, faced our problems, tried to understand the lesson of them, that we would have to surrender a lot of our beliefs. And almost everything you do every day is based upon your beliefs. What if your beliefs are wrong? What if a part of your beliefs are wrong? What if something in your belief system should have been changed and you didn't change it? I'm helping a group of individuals at each decade of life, those who are 30 to 70, men and women, and all I'm doing is asking them a series of questions. And over a six-month period, these individuals are using these questions as the basis for making changes in their life. And to see what is the result if you can focus on some issues and come up with some new ideas. So I'm going to go through some questions. Not that I'm going to have the answer. I'm merely going to open the door. But what's nice about opening doors, just like Dr. Lipton did, he showed that pay attention science, but all of science disagreed with him. All of it. Why? Why couldn't everyone simply say, wow, we have a whole new way of looking at things? Because they were so rigidified, they were so collectively indoctrinated into the dogma, the ritual, the creed, the belief that what they had been told and what their subconscious was processing was real. But he showed it wasn't. Now here's one man saying, look at the milieu, look at the medium. 
And if had, he had looked back in the 1800s, there was a na man named Beecham who was Pasteur's uh, contemporary, and where Pasteur was saying, it is the microbe that causes disease, Beechamp was saying, no, it's the medium that the microbe exists in that causes disease. No one paid attention to Beechamp. At the time, no one paid attention to, to Dr. Lipton, even to this day. We have, we're still focusing on the gene, the gene, the gene. Everything's in your gene. If the gene says you're going to be uh, dying at a certain age or if you're going to have cancer, look at how many women had their breasts removed because doctor says, hmm, you've got the gene that predicts you're going to get breast cancer. Completely healthy women with nothing wrong with their breasts went in and had their doctors remove their breasts, remove their daughter's breasts because they were told, you've got the gene. That is how really distorted the whole science of genetics has become. But it's only a symptom of the larger distortion of reality of our entire society. Let's begin our journey. For all of you of every decade and in between, let's do something a little different. In the process of emptying our life, so we take everything out to see what works. Have you ever just one day gone to your sock drawer and taken all your socks out and see which ones match and don't match and, and you think, wow, I've got all this stuff in here that doesn't match and then you throw it away? And there's a part of you that doesn't want to throw anything away. I mean, look in your closets, look in your garage and your attics and your basement, look at all the stuff we just accumulate. Look at the people we accumulate. Look at all the things we accumulate that serves no useful purpose. We have a hard time surrendering things because so much of our identity is based upon collecting things. We collect degrees and money and possessions and friends because that's what we become. We become an extension of everything we collect. But do we ever stop and say, what is the total sum of my world and the relevance of it from what I've collected? Are you a better person, a wiser person, a more humane person, a kinder person? Are you a more empathetic person based upon what you collect? What if you emptied out everything and then only put back into your life what serves the essential self? But how do we know what's essential when part of what we collect is our identity? How many times have you gone through every moment of every day doing as best as you can, working as hard as you can, only to realize, I'm still empty. I'm, I don't feel that completeness. If I'm working this hard, I ought to feel better about myself. I recently saw a film called Being Julia uh, with Annette Bening. And there's a point in the film where this famous actress, this British actress, that's what she's playing, and her husband, a producer uh, of, of, of theater, uh, is having an affair with a younger man, a friend of her son. And she kind of accepts that her husband shouldn't know about it, but if he does, you know, well, they're kind of modern. And then she realizes that everything she was going through to both have this man in her life, and then when he no longer wanted to be a part of it, to show her distress of not having was all just part of her acting. Her whole life was just acting. Everything was an illusion. Everything in her life was an illusion. And I thought about how many people I know that all they do every day is play act. The doctor who says, we're here to help you, and kills you. Well, that's play acting. <laughs> and, and the curtain is, your life is gone <laughs> or you're injured. You look at how many people die each year because of bad medicine, it's uh, conservatively the number one cause of death in America. More people die each year, 786,000, because of bad medicine than all other causes out there. But no one says, change the script. Stop acting like you want to help someone and look at the results of what you do. But we won't do that. We'd rather look at the effort that we put into something than the results from that effort. So we reward ourselves with effort. I work hard at my job. I want to help people. But are you helping people? Yes or no? All you rheumatologists, do you have a cure for arthritis? The answer is no. But what did you give people? Minimum. 55,000 dead people from Vioxx, Celebrex. How many drugs have you given with absolute certainty they should work and never looked at the fact of all these dead bodies? 
50,000 Americans in one year die malnutrition from going into a hospital. They got the malnutrition in the hospital. Did any dietitian, nu nutritionist, nurse, or doctor say, hmm, what are we doing wrong here? Should we do something different? No, they say, we did everything we had to do. Yeah, but the patient died. Well, but that's not our fault. We were following the script, just like, just like Annette Benning. Her script for her life was all just acting. How many people act sincere and aren't? We elect presidents based upon the level of their sincerity. And don't ask, okay, so the guy's sincere, but what, what about the consequences of his actions? How many people are alive or dead because of it? We are so caught up into the mystique that life is simply what we should accept that we never question whether or not what we're accepting is real. So how I would suggest that we start our first step is select everything as if you were starting over. Now what would change? Well, when I go into someone's refrigerator, when I went into my brother's refrigerator, um, I immediately closed the door. I think there were <laughs> organisms in there that were the CDC could not kill. And they were living in the food that my brother had. Now, my brother's not that unusual. I'm sure many other Americans have things that when you smile in the refrigerator, something smiles back and shouldn't. <laughs> and, oh, dirty you can't imagine. What do you mean? So it's a little dirt. Won't hurt you? Yeah, it will. Well, it didn't hurt me. Well, you've got cancer. How do you know it didn't hurt you? Well, that didn't come from cigarette smoking. It didn't? No. Clean out everything and then start over. Think of your wardrobe. What would change? If you just cleaned it out and say, I want a whole new wardrobe. I used to drive my friends uh, to despair because every two years I would completely redo all the furnishings in my apartment. I had a large Upper West Side Manhattan apartment and uh, I would do different styles. Why are you changing, Gary? Well, because I'm bored with what I had and part of the excitement of life is creating something new. Yeah, but it's a lot of effort. Of course it's effort. But you know what is more effort? Trying to adapt to something that's boring. Look at your sex life. Boring. Look at your conversation. Real boring. Right? Look at almost everything in our lives. Now, am I right? And then we adapt to it, and we just kind of, well, another day, another dollar, and i got to eat the same things, go to the same thing, talk, mm -hmm, same conversations, right? Well, start over. Start over and say, I'm going to have a different kind of conversation, one that's going to be surprising. I actually want to have meaningful conversations. Ooh. <laughs> a meaningful conversation? Wow. Well, that would eliminate a lot of conversations, wouldn't it? Yeah. Most conversations, because they're not meaningful. Now, why aren't they meaningful? Because we don't see the purpose of a meaningful conversation, because it means we have to talk about something, and we have to first select something as meaningful, and then look at it as if there's a way of changing it. If you're not willing to change something, you're not going to focus on it, are you? A fear of knowing is a fear of doing, so said Fritz Perl, the discoverer of Gestalt. That means if we don't want to change something, we won't look for it to change. So everything in your life, select it as if this is a new day, something fresh and vital. From the color of the clothes we wear, to the type of friends that we have, to what we do with those friends, and what we do with ourselves. Even your bodies. How many people do I know? How many men going through andropause from 40 on up? They're losing muscle mass. They're, uh, they're losing their sense of energy and enthusiasm. Their passion for things are gone. They're even losing their rear end, the gluteus. It, it does. Look at, look, look at most men in their 20s. Their, their gluteus is round and solid. Then look at men, every decade it gets smaller and smaller, till then it's a pancake. It's flat. Flat rear ends. And that's why so many guys just fall into toilets. <laughs> and that's embarrassing. I mean, what do you do when you're kind of, your legs are up in the air and you're, help, get me out. It can happen. <laughs> but then ask that guy, okay, what kind of body we'd want? And where their mind's going to go is not what kind of body I'd like to have, what kind of mind I'd like to have is, well, what kind of effort is it going to take? Well, it's going to take an effort. It's not going to be easy. Well, if it's too hard, if it's going to disrupt me, if it's going to make me uncomfortable, I can't do it. So you, the level of your comfort determines 
your reality. So you've adapted everything to a low level of discomfort. So the moment a conversation is uncomfortable, you become defensive. The moment you're supposed to do something to change to grow, you, you back off. The older we get, as each decade approaches, the less we focus upon what we need to do to change. We start focusing upon, I can't go back, I'm never going to be as young, as attractive, as accepted, as passionate. So I just got to kind of squeeze my life into an ever narrow frame of existence. So I'll hang with people who are like me and I'll exclude everyone who's not. And so your life goes from here to here and you just adapt to it. That's the problem of what we do when we age. Next up, when you need someone special and someone to be special, everything then becomes an edited illusion. Think of how many times that the basis of whatever you do is because you project upon another person your own incompleteness, your own insecurity, your needs. And then everything that should be noticed about a person, you have to edit out because it doesn't meet your, the special person. So all these other deficiencies, all these other qualities, that should be looked at and challenged, you kind of don't pay attention to because you're needing something special. Think of the politicians that we need to be strong and we look, overlook all their other deficiencies. Think of the school teacher who is biased. Think of the people who are prejudiced. And because we need something from them, we exclude any uh, real critiquing. Instead of looking carefully and saying, if I need someone special out there, it's because I don't feel special in here. For every deficiency you have, you're merely going to look at another person to fill up that deficiency. Well, who out there is special enough to fill the void in your life? No one. And all that's going to happen when you go on that route is you're going to waste a lot of your life expecting someone else to make you feel the way you should make yourself feel. And when they can't do it, that's when the arguments start. Next. How do you compensate for feelings of inadequacy? Never fully relaxing, always feeling vulnerable, never wanting to let yourself go, never truly being in the moment, always planning everything, always having to control everything. That's what happens when we feel inadequate. Almost always we will compensate for inadequacy. And when we compensate for any place we feel inadequate, we're really feeling vulnerable. We hope someone doesn't find our vulnerability. So we protect our vulnerabilities. We disguise them. And the older we get, as each generation comes, we throw more levels of insulation around our deficiencies. And then we only focus upon what we know will not embarrass us, that we can do with some sense of completeness, and so we kind of hide there, least off anyone finds where we're inadequate. And we'll compensate. Some people feel so vulnerable because of their inadequacy, they overeat. Or they drink, or gamble, or spend time distracted in something. They don't even try to hide it anymore. And other people are very good at hiding their deficiencies. Well, I want to ask you, how do you grow? by just promoting what you can do well or by eliminating what you can't and then balancing your life in a more complete way. We have a lot of people, everybody, in fact, does something well. Everybody. I don't care if it's shining shoes or cutting hair or making missiles or broadcasting the news. Everybody has mastered something. But what about the rest of their life? Where is the balance in their life? Without balance, you're imbalanced. And when you're imbalanced, then everything is going to be distorted. It is the imbalance and distortion that causes disharmony. Disharmony leads to disease. Stress comes from what we cannot handle. So the, anything that is considered a stressful situation is because we can't handle the outcome of it, so we feel vulnerable to the consequences of it. And when you feel vulnerable that you're going to have a negative consequence, then you stress yourself, and then what you fear, you actually manifest. 